Well, cool. Craig, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. Greg, thanks for having me on. Yeah. Good to see, so, you. Good to see you. Yeah. So for, for those of you who don't know Craig, uh, Craig is with uh, or is the founder of uh, North Star Executive Search. Am I getting that right? That's right. North Star Group. So Cool. And you're also the host of the Aerospace Executive Podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, how long have you been doing that for? I was just looking at that yesterday. I've done 130 episodes Shit. of that. So it's about <laughs> almost, uh, it'll be three years in March. All right. Well, I so, think this is going to be episode 12 of this podcast. So there you go. I got a, I got a little bit of catching uh, up to do. I'm in the top, I'm in the top 20. There you go. So <laughs> you made it. Perfect. Um, well, cool. So, you know, I, I wanted to first uh, maybe get started by if you could give us a, a quick intro into uh, who you are, what you've been doing, maybe your just a quick rundown of your uh, your career so far. So, yeah, Craig Pickin. Um, I got started in this industry as a naval flight officer. So okay. uh, 19, I graduated from college. I went right into the Navy. I flew uh, E-2 Hawkeyes for eight years. Um, Decided I don't want to make the Navy a career anymore. I okay. went to Gulf, went to, to Gulfstream for four years. Started there as a sales engineer. Um, traveled the world with uh, with Steve Fuller uh, for a couple of years, and then went over to their government special missions team. Okay, worked with them, and then ultimately left there. Went to Bombardier Business Aircraft, and I was uh, one of the early FlexJet salespeople. So I had the Southwest U.S. Uh, region for FlexJet. Um, Interestingly enough, I left the industry after FlexJet for about five years and went into very high end real estate development. So uh, we were doing uh, luxury residential real estate properties, had a blast there. Um, financial crisis came around um, when Wachovia Bank blew up. So did real estate uh, development yeah. and uh, it was a lot of fun. Not really. <laughs> and I looked at, looked at my wife. I said, damn, we got to go find a job. <laughs> um, I had an offer to go uh, work with one of the OEMs on the sales side of the house and it was 2008 and I just didn't want to go do that again. I didn't want to travel. I didn't want to do that again. You know, that. And interestingly enough, uh, a fellow that I used to hire to train my sales teams in the real estate world called me up and said, Hey, you would be a really good executive recruiter. He's like, I'm working with this group and you should meet them. And so I went and met him. I talked to him for a while, kind of, I liked what they did, but didn't quite see the benefit to me in joining them. So I started my own thing. Okay. So in 2008, <laughs> I started North Star Group with a focus of um, just, you know, becoming a, becoming a significant player in the aviation and aerospace world. So I, uh, I focus, the vast majority of my clients are smaller and middle market aviation companies. Okay. Um, I do 50% business aviation, 50% on the commercial side of the house. I place a lot of CEOs for private equity companies, a lot of CFOs, vice president, general managers, um, you know, primarily in the aftermarket MRO space. So that's, you know, that's, you know, that's where I've been for the last 13 years. Cool. So how, how did you like, as you were looking at making this transition and considering, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get into executive search. How did that process start for you? Because it's, it's, uh, it's different in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so what, what was that transition like? Uh, yeah. Hey, look, it's, if, uh, you know, it's humbling, it's a humbling experience. You know, you, you come out and you, you know, you say, Hey, I'm hanging a shingle. It's much like anybody start does yeah. a startup business. You're like, I'm hanging a shingle. Everybody goes, you're doing what? <laughs> and I had a lot of people shaking their head at me and saying, you know, you're, you're nuts. Um, but uh, I was talking to once again. My wife is a, a great has been a great life and business partner with me. And she goes, "I go, where do we start?" She goes, "How about A?" You remember the World Aviation Directory? Yeah, um, big thing. We, yeah. we, we had the World <laughs> Aviation Directory, and she goes, "Why don't you start with A?" And my uh, my first client was a company called Aero Turbine, and it's okay. a, it's 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 not a they're not a company anymore, but they were focused on engine leasing for the commercial aftermarket parts and engine leasing for the uh, commercial aviation space. We hit it off. And for a couple of years, I was, I just became the, the, the guy 
and aftermarket parts and engine leasing. Um, I started, you know, really didn't do anything business aviation at the time, but mm-hmm. had a really good, my first year I thought was going to suck. It was actually really good. I was like, wow, okay, maybe I'm pretty good at this. <laughs> Second year came along and it was better. And third year was even better. And um, look, it's, it, it, for me, it was pretty easy because I know the industry very, very well. There's, mm. you know, it's, you know, there's, there's, you know, yeah, you, know, you you can look at a business and go, yeah, okay, here's where, yeah, you know, here's where you need to go, here's where you need to talk to, you know, yeah, you know, here's how I can help you, here's how I can't help you, etc. Um, so that's just how I grew. It's like I know the industry real well, I know business real well. I've run a PNL. Um, you know, let's just go, let's just go do it and have a lot of fun. Sure. And um, I just like working the smaller mid market. I really enjoy the smaller middle market companies, just helping them get, get better. Yeah. And so, you know, get, getting started now, you're, I guess this would be what, 15 years into it? 13, it'd be 14 years, it'd be 14 years in April. So, okay. So 14 years into it, what would you say, you know, as, as you've been working with executives, and I know that you have a a big network of people that you Mm -hmm. know very well. And I think that's, probably what makes you so good at what you're what you're doing. How do you see executives that you're placing today? Is there any difference in whether it's skill set or mindset or just is there any difference between 2008 when you had kicked this off? Yeah, there there really is because in 2008, remember it was the financial crisis, and there was mm-hmm. a lot of fear out there. And then there was really just a lot of, you know, the, you know, there was a lot of fear. Okay. And people really didn't know what was coming, what was coming next. Um, so they were, they were, they were cautionary. Today, I say that they're eager. I think there's a okay. lot more, there's a lot more eagerness out there. Um, you know, and, and a lot of it is, it depends on the executive and what they're looking for. But what I'm, what I'm seeing now is a real hunger to, hey, look, you know, I don't know if it's COVID but there's a real hunger out there now to go, what's next in life? What's next for me? Mm -hmm. How do I, you know, how do I take this thing I call a career and make it fun, make it rewarding, make it enjoyable. So it's not just a, you know, a J-O-B job. Right. Um, And that's most of the people I'm, you know, that's what I see now. People are a little bit less risk adverse, Mm -hmm. which is a good, which is good. I mean, it's, it's and and those working. are you know when you say they're they're less risk adverse is that both on the candidate side and the the company side of things how are companies looking at hires maybe a little bit mm. differently today? Well, hey, look, companies are yeah you know it comes down to you know companies absolutely they they just need strong players at the end of the day you know there's only two things when you know what I tell young people is this, you know, as you're growing your career, and I, I work with a lot of college kids, a lot of, you know, University of North Carolina, Wilmington, I'm a mentor to a lot of college kids. And ultimately, what I tell them is that when you go to interviews from now until the day you retire, understand that the person across the desk from you or the, you know, sit across from you, he, only, he or she only wants to know two things. Can you make them money? Or can you save them money? It's a top line or bottom line thing. Right. It's a very short conversation. But really what it does is there's that, there's that space in the middle between top line and bottom line called value. And mm-hmm. it's like, are you going to be a value to my organization? Sure. So companies today are looking at their employees and they're saying, all right, you know, is this person adding value to my organization? Um, you know, they 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 know who's going to make a difference. So you know, at the end of the day, they're looking at you know their employees are going who's a, who's yeah you know, who's value who's okay who's a cost right sure. and that's that's kind of what it's at. And so they're they're really looking for the value creation. You know, on the flip side, I tell companies the same thing. You know, that person you're sitting from across from, you know, wants a you know wants a a, a career top line. Yeah. You know, they want a life bottom line and you got to put value. You got to put value into their life. You got to show them a path why coming to your company is going to help them grow as a person. How are you going to make their life 
better in some way, shape, or form? Are you a better boss? Are you offering more money? Are you offering them a better place to live? Are you offering them a fast track career? Things like that. So that's the dialogues right. that everybody's having, or right. at least the dialogues I'm having with people now. Sure. And do you see any like particular movement of candidates and like a direction of like, is there any, is there any, I'd say trend in candidates looking to go to maybe smaller companies or candidates looking to go to bigger mm -hmm. companies? I know there's a lot of discussion around, you know, company culture and perks. And of course, in the last year, mm -hmm. you know, like you see all this stuff on LinkedIn about, you know, 100% remote versus in office or part time. I mean, anything in particular that you're seeing there? Yeah, look, the, you know, and this is what I tell people straight up, you know, it's it's got to be a thing, you know, so some big company people just don't belong in a small company. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and and not to ding on OEMs, but look, you're an OEM person. You know, you you know, the, the value of being with an OEM is you have a business card and, and your name is on that card. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of benefit to being at the OEM. So when you go to a smaller company, there is life is different. I mean, you know, life is, it's, you're taking out your trash. You went from a nice office to a cubicle. Um, you know, it, it's, you gotta be scrappy. It's just, you know, less rules. It's almost like fight club, right? You're, yeah. you're, you know, it's, it's a different world. So, but yes, people are going, Hey, look, you know, I'm a GE, my $10 million P and L, which I'll grow. 10%. So I'll make a million bucks for the company really isn't making a whole lot of difference in the world. Right. Where can I take my skills? You know, small companies, you know, small companies love people who are motivated and you know, there's, you know, if you can make a difference in our life, there's a big, sure. pay, there's a big payoff. I mean, it's a risk sure. to reward thing. So, you know, a lot of you know, people are looking for private equity opportunities. Um, you know, I'll just give you a classic example. Um, young fella, I mean, I wish I had this job offer when I was 34 years old. Um, I placed a young fella as a vice president in a business, as a as a vice president of a private equity owned company. Salary was about equal to what he was making at the large company. The bonus was a little bit better, but all of a sudden they threw equity on there. And the guy's going, wait a minute. If I do what I say I can do for these people, I'm going to walk away in a couple of years with with a seven figure payout. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And Huge if you can't, difference. and yeah. if you can't do for them what you say you're going to do, or if you don't do for them what you say you're going to do, it's going to be a very short conversation. Sure. You know? So, but he's looking at it going, "Wow, um, you know, I can get, I can do that." And I go, "Yeah." And when you do that, you're 38 years old. And you go do another turn in the barrel because now you've got private equity experience. You're going to drink from a fire hose. You're going to learn a whole lot more. Yeah. You know, do you want to sit? Do you want to sit at the the nice office at the company you're at, or you want to go get scrappy and you know take your chances? Yeah. She's like, yeah, throw me in, coach. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, he liked that. You know, and and it's interesting because you know we we had a small company, we were growing, and mm -hmm. uh, and we we had a number of I'll say you know somewhat unsuccessful hires mm -hmm. in uh, in people that came from larger companies, um, and I think in uh, you know we looked at that and saying you know oh they okay they've they've done this mm -hmm. before they've worked at a larger company they've been able to grow and you know, launch new products and, and things of that nature. Um, but it didn't always work out. And I always looked at it and thought, okay, well, maybe they're, they're, you know, they, they were exposed to some of these things, but maybe they didn't really mm -hmm. do the heavy lifting that's required to, to get it done. Mm -hmm. And so for, for people that are looking to potentially make that transition from, you know, a large company and they're saying, okay, you know, maybe I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not as fulfilled in this type of role. I want to move mm -hmm. to a smaller company where I can make a difference. Mm -hmm. There's certain ways that they should approach that or things that they should be cautious of in, in, you know, looking to make that type of change. Yeah. Look, it's, it's, it's like I said, it's a, it's a totally different mindset. 
Now I'll go back to my, I'll just go back to my story a little bit. Yeah. And I'll tell you how I became a small company person. So I left Bombardier and we had a beach house in Huntington Beach, California. We moved to the beautiful metropolitan town of Lewisburg, West Virginia. Okay. 10,000 people. Never heard of it. <laughs> right on the Virginia, West Virginia border. And there was a, there was an old resort. There's an old resort there and they called the Greenbrier Resort. And we went and developed it. I joined the team that was developing the Greenbrier. And, you know, so there's a couple of things here. One, no salary, commission only. You know, you're, you're, you're in it to win it now. Yeah. Commission only. Two, are you willing to invest in yourself? Um, you know, look, we're not going to get you all the leads you need. We're not going to get you all the marketing. We're, you know, we're a small yeah. budget company too. We need all hands moving in, right? We need all hands on deck. Um, three, you know, it, you know, there's not a lot of rules here. So you're going to have to figure it out as you go along. So adaptability. So ultimately, um, you know, we went out there, got very very comfortable with commission only made a pile of my i'm not ashamed to sit there and tell people i go i made a pile of money living in lewisburg west virginia mm -hmm. my wife and i laughed all the way to the bank <laughs> um you know it, it's it's capitalism at its finest and we loved it um had a great time living in the town i spent probably a thousand dollars or more a month on just myself my personal branding just doing it yeah, if I had a customer saying, hey, I'll send you the check Tuesday, I go, hey, you live over in D.C. I live three hours away from D.C. Yeah. How about I come over to D.C.? I buy you dinner and I'll just pick the check pick up, when, up. <laughs> and when you get there. Right. So you go, OK, the guy's like, OK, so you go to the yeah. Capitol Grill and, you know, in D.C. and you buy the guy an expense or a girl the expensive dinner and you get the check, and you take it back and you've got the sale. Um, yeah, that's a lot of what invest you know it's it's being willing to fly coach yeah. you know it's yeah versus business class or first class it's you know your expense account is 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 minimal and it's, you know it's it's uh i can very well afford to fly first class anywhere in the world i fly coach why because i'm a small business owner and i can't get my arms around paying for first class. So you, yeah. you find me in row 27C. That's a lot of the difference. You know, if you want to go to a small company, you got to start to think like small company, limited resources. You know, it's not the bank of, you know, the bank yeah. of Wall Street anymore. So yeah. In in general, um, you know, I hear a lot of people, especially in this last uh in this last year, uh my dad uh, my grandma, a, a lot of people are saying, you know, people don't want to work anymore. Um, and I think that's a general, <laughs> that's a a general thing that you, yeah. that you're hearing out there. Are, are you seeing any like particular change in maybe the, the young, younger generation mm -hmm. that's coming up? Do you see that being true or is that no. just, a, no. uh, yeah, no, the, the people <laughs> who want to make a difference, the people who want to make a difference in the world want to work. Mm -hmm. And they want to work hard and they're willing to gut it out. You know, look, yeah. the, you know, you've got people, look, you, you know, you've got, you know, hourly, hourly, you know, hourly workers, you know, loading, you know, pick a, pick a task, loading yeah, trucks, sure. you know, sweeping sure. the floors, whatever. And they're going to come and they're going to go and they're going to, you know, they're going to come and go for another dollar an hour. Right. Um, you know, you just, you got to go with it. The people that want to make a difference in the I'm actually really bullish on the younger generation now. I think they're really yeah. smart. I think they're incredibly smart. Mm -hmm. I think they're incredibly tech savvy. Um, I think the ones who want to make a difference, a real difference in the world are the ones who want to be a positive force in the company and they really want to help other folks. So, you know, it's it's sort of like I told the CEOs last week at or two weeks ago, corporate jet investor. You know, look for the people who need the A. And when I say about the people who need the A, think about the people who in the life they were willing to push a little bit harder in college to get an A versus accepting a B. Or they were, you know, they've got some incredible achievements. Maybe they played, you know, varsity sports in college, or maybe they were Eagle Scouts, or maybe they, yeah, you know, whatever. Pick pick some great achievements. Yeah. And you find the people that can say, hey, look, in my life at 
30 years or under, here's what I accomplished. I paid my way through school or I went to the military and I got out of the military, found out that, hey, look, if I don't have a college degree, I'm kind of nowhere. So I I got the GI Bill and I worked 40 hours a week. And I put myself through college or I you know, played D1 sports and I was up every morning at 430, um, you know, running and working out before class. You know, yeah. Th those people aren't easily found, but they want to work. They want to make a difference and and they will. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's just you just got to dig a little harder. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I I, I think you know there, <laughs> I I've pushed back on that. Yeah, sure. You know when you look at maybe some of the the local restaurants or these types mm -hmm. of positions, obviously there's been some changes in the last year and and that that have created some of the things that we're seeing on a you know small you know the, those types of businesses, but. In general, I think that there's a lot of really hungry people out there that are excited about yep. doing great things. And mm -hmm. and I'm seeing a lot of excitement in aviation as well. Yep. Um, and it seems like, and I've had a lot of discussions around like the workforce development and you know, trying to, there's obviously a shortage in, in a lot of the different roles. I think people usually talk to it uh, mostly about pilots, but you know, the whole support structure, we need more people getting mm -hmm. involved in the industry. And I, I, I see that I see excitement from the younger generation in, in aviation and, and getting into it. You know, I think there is a lot of, there's a lot of excitement around the industry now, a lot of tech. I mean, you think about yeah. like the EV tall stuff and the, yeah. the electric and the electric aircraft and some of the new technology that's coming out of the high, you know, hydrogen, you know, hybrid electric. Yeah. There's a lot of, you know, for the, the technical crowd, the engineers yeah. and stuff. There's a lot of things to say, Hey, look, we're, we're actually a pretty cool place to come. Yeah. You know, for the pilots, um, you know, look, I think if you talk to Bill Koch, Bill's the former CEO of uh, AMR Combs, former chairman of Hawthorne global, um, you know, the, the, the MRO company. Um, yeah. gr he does a lot of executive coaching right now. And I agree with him. You know, young people want a place where they add purpose. And now look, there's, you know, I, I read a story the other day about a, Apple just let go. There's a big controversy. Apple just fired a, a product manager who decided to become come into the company and be a political activist. And she was going to, she was going to rid Apple of all the ism, the racisms, the sexisms, the ageisms, the whatever isms. And yeah, hey, look enough just do your job yeah you know, we appreciate your we appreciate your desire to change the world but enough's enough you gotta go right. um people want a sense of purpose so i think like you know let's just take a business aviation your part 135 operators instead of having your pilots just come in and fly say hey look we want you to really be a part of this business and we want your input every day as to what you or we could be doing better, because ultimately that's what makes the company better. I'll tell you, he's done a great job with that. His yeah. flex jet, his flex jet. You know, Teamsters Union, when they had the company, they decertified the union pilot. You know, the the sense of um, enjoyment amongst the woods, the the job satisfaction level amongst the pilots is very high. Mm -hmm. You say, look, we need you to be. A part of the company because we're all in this together and and we want you to be rowing with us whereas you know you gotta you know yeah maybe some of the airlines and the pilots are their union they just show up you know and it's like yeah you, if, if you're part of the union you're not necessarily rowing with the company so that's right. the you know that's the difference and that's what i love about your know, business aviation you know i was talking to don campion at Banyan Air Service, I'd never met Don before. I know, I know, I know Banyan well, or yeah, you know, I just know Banyan well from the industry. Yeah, sure. But I'd never met Don, and I'm like talking to him, and I'm like, wow, what an impressive guy! His average tenure of his employees is over 20 years. He's got them engaged in the business. Um, I was talking to him. I'm not going to, yeah, you know, really. I don't want to give away his. But but he's got you know Don's not a young fella he's not you know, not not hugely old but he's not a young fella but he's already got his employees he's thinking about his employees for the next stage of the business and they know it and you're like 
where do you find a bunch of Don Campions who are really getting his people involved in the business? Where do you get more people at FlexJet who are really getting their people involved in the, in the business? And that's what, you know, that's what I like to see. Yeah. Um, and yeah, then you get everybody rowing in the same direction. Sure. Mm. And yet, yet, uh, you know, mentioned private equity before and the mm. example that you had given. And I know that there's been a good amount of PE activity in business aviation. And, uh, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of it on the technology and software side of things. Um, what are you seeing, uh, you know, in regarding PE getting involved in more involved in the industry? How do you see that if impacting, you know, what's going on in the space? You know, I don't know if I see it. Yeah, I certainly don't see it as a negative. I mean, yeah. I kind of like I like private equity, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Look, you know, at the end of the day, um, I think private equity, you know what they're going to do. I mean, it's a very predictable model. Private equity comes in, they want to buy a company, they want to grow, they want to grow the, the EBITDA value, they kind of want out of it in five or six years. So you know that whatever they're going to do, they're going to try to enhance the, the value of the business. And you, you go back into the mid early 1990s, you know, Gulfstream aircraft was, you know, people don't realize this today, Gulfstream was 36 hours away from closing its doors for good. I mean, yeah. it's out of business. And Ted Forsman comes in, private equity, Forsman Little Company, you know, puts some money in, hires a great management team, Brian Moss, Bill Boister, Chris Davis was the CFO, Fred Breidenbach was the uh, the guy who ran manufacturing. You know, that management team, that one got Press Henny and Dan Nail. And they create they grew they created this phenomenal machine in the 90s. And and you know what? They all got rich from it. You know, you know, Bill, you know, Sean Vick was in that. They all got wealthy. Yeah. I don't care that they got wealthy. I, I'm glad they got wealthy. Because today you've got a company in Savannah, Georgia, that employs 13,000 people in Savannah. Plus they bought KCAC up in you know, Michigan. Plus they've got Dallas. Plus they've got their stuff in California. And now they've got you know, what, nine different airplanes are selling and they've had, you know, so, you know, you know, that's the way I look at a little bit of what private equity has done for the industry. Um, yeah. You know, I just see more and more, but it's a predictable model. It's, it's, we yeah. want to buy it. We want to buy it at a, we want to buy it at a right number. It may be a little bit, you know, maybe healthy. It may not be healthy, but if it's not, if it's not healthy, we're going to make it healthy and we're going to roll with it. So, yeah. Yeah. And it seems, it seems like, you know, um, with the, with more interest from private equity coming into the, into the space. And like I said, more, I, I'm seeing a lot of it on the, the software and the technology side mm -hmm. of things. I think in a lot of these areas in the past, they've been, you know, it's a lot of bootstrap companies. They've, uh, kind of created a product that has value but they've maybe not been able to scale it properly or they sold it at mm -hmm. prices that were too low to continue to invest in that mm -hmm. product. And now as we're seeing, you know, these groups that want to invest in this industry, I think it's creating new products and services and, and doing it in a way that is scalable and sustainable and mm -hmm. ends up benefiting the, the end users, whether you're an operator or an OEM or, yeah an FBO or what, whatever your business may be. Well, it's, it's sort of like your, it's sort of like your, your company, Flight Docs, your company, you know, your private, you had private equity investors in there. I know, and, and, and you know, I know, you know, I know them well, they're yep. phenomenal people and they gave you capital. Yeah. You, know, you had a good product and they said, all right, look, we want to, we want to buy some, use the capital to grow it. Ultimately you sold the, the company ATP. So I, you know, I look at, I look at what they've done and they've, they've, they've added a layer of value to the industry which would not have been there. Camp Systems, for instance, was all private equity before yeah. it, you know, got bought by Hearst Media. You know, you look at yep. what Neil Neil Book is doing up at you know JSSI. Yeah. It was yeah, you know, family office, and now they just took a a big you know uh, a big investment for private equity. Um, yeah. I think it's putting a, la a layer of capital in that's allowing some smaller mid market companies the ability to grow and do things that the OEMs would never dream about you know the you know, you know the yeah. oems are willing to take some risk but they're not willing to take all the you know they're not willing to take all the risk they need you know they're like the yeah. big cinder blocks and in between the big cinder block you got to have the the little rocks to make the wall right 
So sure, that's you know it's where I like private equity. Yeah, and so you know, looking at the the future of the the industry, you had mentioned you know some of the electric, you know, and urban air mobility and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. How do you how are you seeing that? You know, and and where do you see that, you know, fitting in and maybe a, a timeline? And I know that you're, mm. you're in touch with a lot of people at, at, uh, at some of these organizations, but mm -hmm. what, what are you seeing for the future of, of aviation? I see a lot of science experiments. Yeah. I see, <laughs> I see some real products and I see some science experiments. Yeah. Um, eVTOL. eVTOL could go two ways. It could be either a, a monstrous home run with a couple of, couple of companies. I'm not there yet. I'm not, yeah. A, yeah, look, I'll just, but I'll tell people straight up. I'm not necessarily <laughs> the early adopter of technology. Um, you know, I gotta, I gotta see it. Yeah. I gotta see it first. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think a lot of what EV tall, I think a lot of the noise around EV tall is I could take a Robinson R66 helicopter, which is actually quite fuel efficient. And I could fly it from LaGuardia to the, you know, downtown heliport in New York, a whole lot cheaper right. than, yeah, what Joby's going to sell their EV tall for. Um, so I, I see some speed bumps, but in the meantime, I also see what Ray, Roy Ganzarski is doing out in Seattle with his company Magniex or Eviation, um, kind of the same genre. Yeah, you know, Magniex and Eviation are kind of the same companies, and it's electric. Yeah, you know, Roy will tell yeah. you that any flight under five hundred miles will be done by an electric aircraft. Um, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll be game. Yeah. GA, there's no reason that you can't have a yeah. Cessna 172 or 182 or a Cirrus powered by a, an electric motor. Sure. Um, I like what, uh, there's a company out of uh, Denver, Colorado called XTI aircraft. I really like what they're doing. Um, it's not electric, but what it is, it's a, a GE catalyst engine powering generators or electric motors. Yeah, it's kind of you know, powering electric motors and the electric motors are turning three ducted fans. So what they're saying is with five passengers and a pilot on board, we'll be able to take off vertically, fly 300 nautical miles, I'm sorry, 600 nautical miles at 300 knots. And you know, the benefit of the electric motors is that we take out all the transmissions that make helicopters so expensive to operate. I'm like, great. Right. I look at that and I say, there is, you know, the light jet category of business aviation has been, you know, sort of prime for disruption. Yeah. I see that technology as the uh, disruptor. Um, Bob LaBelle is running that company. Mike Hinderberger is their VP of engineering. I see that to be a, a, a really cool, space um yeah it's not easy but I, I i see it having some some roots so i i, I like sure. the you know i like the uh, the level of innovation that's coming into the industry right now just because everybody's thinking about green you know everybody's yeah. thinking about hey what's different you know what can we do yeah, yeah. Out, outside of you know the aircraft itself do you see anything that's interesting or changing in the way of like charter or fractional or aircraft management. I know that there was a lot of discussion around, you know, some of these businesses at CJI in, in yeah. Miami, but any, any, you know, kind of big changes that you see in that area? I think there's gonna be a lot of consolidation in that area. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is the small, there's, there's three things working against the small part 135 operators. Um, insurance costs are going up. And, and I was just talking to um, somebody this morning that you know, was telling me about the, you know, so if you recall the lady who was killed on the Southwest jet when the rotor burst incident came out, you know, mm -hmm. like tragedy, you know, it's, yeah. it's a, you know, the payout, the insurance payout to her family was, a, was over $80 million. Um, jets are getting more expensive. So any levels of hangar rash are causing, so insurance rates are getting up, liabilities going up. Yeah. Um, pilot costs are going up. So they're having a hard time. The small operators are having a hard time absorbing the new levels of, you know, pilots. And then you've got infrastructure hangers and fuel, and they're not necessarily able to. So I, I see the, 
I see Jet Aviation, EJM, Clay Lacey, Solaris. I probably see 10, maybe wheels, yeah, wheels up. I see yeah. probably 10 management companies out there kind of ruling the world and maybe some other people fitting in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just see a massive consolidation there because of costs. Uh, other things I'm seeing is I think the supply chain is ripe for massive um, innovation. Yeah. Uh, when you think about blockchain technology, you know, you take a part off an aircraft, you send it to repair, you can use blockchain to say, okay, you know, you, you've got now, uh, you know, you've now got back to birth trace on every part. It eliminates fake parts yep. or counterfeit parts in the supply chain. Um, not only does it do that, but I can start to get, you know, what does this part cost? What does it, what does it you know, cost to repair this part? Right. Um, what was the shop that did it? So you've got, like I said, you've got a whole record, but also too, you start to get more into predictive, better predictive analytics. Yeah. You know, so now all of a sudden I, you know, it's, you know, if it's done correctly, realistically, an operator can be getting a part before he or she even need, knows they need a part. Sure. So that's coming. I mean, you know, yeah. a lot of people are starting to, to do that. Yeah. It seems like there's a real opportunity in the, in the parts area for, in the parts segment for more of an e-commerce solution as well. And that, you know, it's been, there's been these parts marketplaces that have been around for some time. And I know that the, the purchasing process, uh, as an operator in a lot of ways is, is pretty antiquated and it involves a lot of phone calls it involves emails sometimes faxes which is just crazy to <laughs> crazy to think still exists yeah. and so you know i think that there's there's another opportunity for you know both technology and companies to to really make a difference here because not only in business aviation but also on the the commercial mm -hmm. side of things right Right. Yeah, no, I mean, and it's all, it's all coming. I mean, you can yeah. just, as sure as the day is long, it's, you know, it's all coming. And, and, you know, I think we're actually, you know, you think about the auto industry and just in time, you know, a lot of what they're doing yeah. just in time. I mean, it's, it's a, a lot of it is, um, you know, you just think about, you know, you know, I always laugh at, you know, like, you know, you know NetJets is a huge operation and I always kind of laugh at them because you got their ops people who want it done fast you got their maintenance people who want it done right. And you got the procurement people who want it done cheap, right? Yeah. <laughs> Pick two. Triple threat. Yeah. But, but maybe if they started to integrate technology a little bit better and if some software companies, technology companies came out yeah. with some really kick butt solutions, they could get all three. You yeah. Know, it's, yeah. You start to think about an airplane. Okay. If this part keeps breaking, what's, what's the, what's, you know, what's in the ecosphere in the airplane that's causing that part to keep breaking. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, then they're, they're an interesting case study, I think, because, you know, they're, they're very unique in, in the way that they do things and their operation. And I know that they've invested quite a bit in technology to, mm -hmm. you know, try and solve these problems. And, and I think one of the obstacles that they have in particular is that, you know, there's not a, there's not a lot of software providers out there that right. will build products that are catered to an operation like that, because, mm -hmm you know, how many customers could you potentially sell that to? And so that's one of the, I know that's one of the obstacles that they have as a, as mm -hmm. a business and is why they have a, you know, a pretty large in-house development team to try and solve some of those problems. Yeah. Yeah. They're look, they're smart. They're smart people. And it's a big, I mean, you think about yeah. what they do. I mean, Hey, look, you got 700 airplanes in your fleet and on any given day, you know, just, you can't change physics. 30 of yeah. them are going to break yeah. and it causes a big headache. And, and, um, you know, it's just, it's just the, the you know, people don't understand the dilemma. I mean, I, airplanes are, airplanes are, are complex machines. Yeah, sure. And keeping them all flying at the same time, especially the day before Thanksgiving, when everybody really wants to fly, that's a, uh, that's a momentous task. Yeah. Um, so that's it. I think, you know, but ultimately, ultimately too, you think about technology and, yeah, you know, hey, look, if if the fractional fleets and the if if the fractional and charter fleets are going to get bigger, which I think they will, you know, the maintenance reliability data going back to the OEMs, 
is going to start to show them naturally where the where the systems need to be more you know robust you sure. know uh, you know, it used to be a typical business jet was flown you know three or four hundred hours a year well you got a fractional jet that's being flown 100 hours 150 hours a month, a month. yeah you, you better start maybe maybe we need to change our focus and start building airplanes for 150 yeah. hours a month right sure um so that you know that kind of technology will come back flow back to the oems for better products as well yeah well, I think in in general, there's a there's a lot that's happening, and I think over the next few years, it'll definitely be interesting. And I think uh, maybe some of the stuff that's happened over the last eighteen months, two years, has really accelerated some of the changes, and it seems like people are trying to get there faster than they've than they've ever tried before. COVID but, put a sense of urgency into yeah. They they, yeah, they what sure. they did what it did was you know everybody went from massive oh my gosh what just happened to you know the the whip came back the other way and it's oh my god now how yeah. do we how do we meet all this demand um with all the supply chain challenges and things like that yeah so put a sense of urgency in it and it all yeah. comes down to people systems processes and technology sure and you know everybody's got to get it all right yeah you have to thrive yeah for sure well you know i guess Switching gears a little bit, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was your podcast, actually. And uh, I know that you have, you're coming up on 200 episodes now. Um, I've been talking to, you know, I'm doing this podcast. I've been talking to uh, some of my customers and some other businesses in the space about podcasting and just, I guess, content creation in general. I wanted to get your take on, you know, what, what do you think about doing a podcast and what has it done for, you know, you, your brand and, and your business? You know, so I, I, my podcast started out as just something, you know, was, I wanted to do something just kind of fun. I was, I was, felt like I was just getting in a rut and was talking yeah. to, uh, so, you know, my, the, the fellow who does my podcast is a guy named Matt Johnson. He produces it for me. Matt Johnson's out in San Diego and I met him and I said, you know, I'm a, I'll, I'll go for it. And uh, and just start doing it and start doing it once a week. And, um, you know, it was something a little bit different. And, you know, look, I don't need, you know, it was just something different. I don't need to be Joe Rogan or, you know, yeah. um, whatever and have a million people listening to it. It's an industry specific podcast. Sure. We talk a little bit about career growth. Um, so it started out as just something fun. And now I've had, you know, I've been to two conferences this month and I've had probably 50 people come up to me and say, man, I really enjoy your podcast. I get a couple of notes today. I got yeah. a couple of notes from one that went out with, you know, I was like, hey, we're, you know, I'm enjoying this. And then they're going back and they're listening to some of the other ones. Um, so I think for my brand, it's, you know, what it really does is it just person. I, I want to say it, it, you know, puts a person behind the recruiter. Um, right. People see a little bit more who I am. They see a little bit more of the people I'm talking to, the subjects we're talking about. And the, the whole goal is there's two goals. Yeah. You know, one, entertain people, be interesting, but more, more so provide, provide some value in some way, shape or form. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, yeah. you know, 30, 40 minute podcast. Hey, look, if I can give you one or two tidbits to take away. Sure. Um, you know, that, that pays out. Yeah. And I think it, it, in general, what I'm seeing is, you know, um, like you said, it, it, it puts the, the personal touch on things. And mm -hmm. so, uh, people are more likely to come up and say hello to you at a conference or shoot you a message or, you know, say, Hey, you know, want to learn more about, you know, about what you're doing and if there's ways that we can work together and, mm -hmm. um, and, um, 10 episodes in and I'm seeing that same thing. And, uh, I think as, as long as you're, talking about the, you know, could be the right things and, and bringing value and just providing, you know, some information or some entertainment. I think that there's a, there's a big value in that. Yeah. I mean, it's like, look, people, you know, it's, you know, it's easy. They can listen to, they can listen to it on the way to the, on the, you know, on their way to work. They can listen yeah. to it in the gym. They can just sit down and say, I don't want to turn, listen to Fox news today. Yeah. And, um, and they can learn something. And, and what really, what I really like is when I'll interview a CEO of a company and then you know, a private equity person calls me up and says, Hey, would you make an introduction? You know, there's, there's something there that we kind of yeah. like, would you make an introduction? Like, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Once again, it's, 
Easy. Yeah. You know, everything you look at, you know, at the end of the day, and, and here's what I, you know, once again, I go back to the college kids, I go, it's not about money. You know, you, you know, if you do all the right things in your career, you, the money will come. Yeah. And it's about helping. It's about being value, helping a CEO get connected with the right, you know, the right equity group. It's about helping somebody find the career of their dreams or the company that really is dying for, yeah. you know, the right program manager and, and you help them and you're going, Hey, you look, and, you know, it's just adding value to people. And that's, that's, that's the way to go about it. So that's what my podcast, what I try to do with it. Cool. How, um, you know, as, as, as you're looking forward, any, any changes to your business, any future plans, or are you kind of, you're, you're doing things it's working and, and are you continuing down that path or oh, how are you, you looking at it? You things? don't know me very well. I'm never content. <laughs> I am never content. Um, I'm never happy. I'm never content. I think, you know, that just kind of breeds complacency. Sure. Um, yeah, no, look, the one thing I've really enjoyed is, and, and now I'm kind of, you know, I'm in, I'm in my mid fifties mm -hmm. and the one thing that I really start to enjoy now is, um, being the mentor over at the university has really opened my eyes. Now my kids are in college too. And, um, you know, so just being a mentor to the kids over in college has really, you know, made me think about working with younger, young executives in a different way. And once again, they're like, Hey, look, you know, if, if I can help you in any way, you're getting ready to go to an interview or you're thinking about something, just call me. We'll talk through it for 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. So the one thing I'm starting to do is add a little bit more career coaching to my practice. Okay. Um, you know, and I like that, that just for personal, you know, I just, I just enjoy it. Yeah. So that's, that's the one thing I'm going to probably start doing, but you know, I like the space I play in. I like the small middle markets. I'm not going to be everything to everybody. There's some people out there that I love doing business with, or some people I don't like doing business with. And, you know, it's a beautiful <laughs> thing I could pick and choose. Right. <laughs> Well, cool. Well, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been great to catch up with you here and, um, yeah, thank you for, for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Um, and we'll have to do it again one of these days. Greg, thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed it today. Congratulations yeah. on all the success you've seen. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks for having all me right. on. Talk soon.